Hey, everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Barrett. Hello. All right. How's it going? Going well. So, Barrett, for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Yeah, uh, my name is Barrett Blake. I am uh, located in Columbus, Ohio area. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As far as, you know, what I do, I, I do all kinds of things. You know, I'm, um, but I also do a lot of hands-on coding, do a lot of stuff for in, in Azure, Logic Apps, uh, Power Automate, uh, Azure Data Factory, um, all that kind of stuff. C-sharp, still do quite a bit of C-sharp around the edges as well. That's a little bit about me. Uh, as far as, you know, my journey, I, I've, I've been involved in, in the .NET stack and Microsoft stack for almost 20 years, almost my entire professional career. Started off with VB.NET, my first job out of college. Uh, after that, I've been pretty much C-sharp, ASP.NET ever since. Uh, been doing a lot, of, a lot of that stuff as well, SQL Server and Azure the last 10 years. And, uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that, you know, it's interesting is that you see a lot of people, a lot of stories popping up of where the, like the power platform, building business applications is like creating careers, people that were, uh, you know, on the edges of tech and then kind of are, are finding a very rapid path, a, a career path for themselves in the business application space. And but yeah, it, very much so. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those areas that has been a lot of, of, of focus for Microsoft, especially, but also in general, you know, uh, you know, the whole low code, no code solutions. Uh, have been a huge focus the last five, six years. And uh, I've, I've found a pretty good niche there uh, myself, you know, doing a lot of that stuff, doing a lot of blogging about that, speaking at conferences uh, and just getting involved in the community around that area. It's, it's a, a really fascinating thing. I, I think it's fantastic. It's great for people who don't don't want to have a whole in-depth, you know, coding career, but still want to be able to do a little bit of, of technical stuff. And, and it's a great area for them to focus. Is there anything different around uh, managing people developing these kinds of solutions than it was previously? Uh, yeah, I mean, th there's quite a bit, bit of difference, I think, you know, um, just because you, you don't need to have as much focus for the people who are working on that stuff. You don't need to have as much focus delving into the, the real deep technical details. Um, you know, you just need to really, the focus needs to be on, on, can you think logically, you know, can you, can you figure out how, you know, what's this step, next step, next step, next step. And, and if you can figure out what the steps are, you know, where, where your data or whatever it needs to do to be needs to move from place to place to place and how it needs to transform as it's going along. If you can just figure out those things, then the whole, you know, low code platform makes it really easy to do that kind of stuff yourself. So cool. So what kind of stuff are you like writing about and speaking about right now? Uh, most of my speaking and, and blogging of the last couple of years has been around Power Automate, uh, but I have done a bit of Blazor recently, uh, something I've been really focused on learning, you know, being able to do C-sharp in the web browser on the front end as opposed to just being server-side. Uh, I think that's really fascinating. It's one of those things that it, it's had some you know bumpy starts, but it's I think it's one of those things that's ready for prime time now. It's, it's one of those things that you can actually put into production applications and make it work very well now. So what kind of uh, solutions are you, so what are you doing for like, you know, internally or for your clients right now? Yeah, most of the, the focus for as far as clients goes is around uh, dynamics and, and the supporting infrastructure, you know, the integrations with external systems, that kind of stuff. Just basically being able to move their data from place to place and, and manipulate and organize that data in the best ways possible, the most efficient ways. And, you know, you, you go into these companies and they've got 20 different systems that all have different types of data, a lot of duplication of data between the things. And, you know, they've got one system for their customer rewards and one system for their, you know, their client information and another system for their human resources. And, and, and none of these systems really do a good job of talking to each other and, you know, Power Platform and, and Azure Data Factory and some of those other solutions that have come along in the last five, six, 10 years have made those kind of integrations, moving that data back and forth a whole lot easier and a whole lot more fun. It's a, it's amazing though that that the uh, the stories have not changed. The details of how you solve them is you know changes. But when I got involved and was doing data center uh, projects, data center consolidation projects in the mid to late nineties, you know it was the same story. Is that you'd see all these home built solutions, more home built than third party uh, solutions. Um, yeah, so that's definitely. diversified. Um, but bringing those together, consolidating data, giving people a unified experience, 
trying to reduce the cost to maintain all the disparate systems that are out there, all those stories are pretty much still in place. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, I think, another one of the great things, you know, 10 years ago, if I had to move data from one system to another, I'd have to do, you know, write a custom solution and take two, three months to do it or in, you know, C Sharp or, or SQL Server or whatever it might be. And, you know, I can go in there in an afternoon in Azure Data Factory and do the same thing that took me three months, 10 years ago. It's great. I love it. Well, and plus, depending on the system, and there's a lot of third-party tools to move. So I actually, I, where I got, I started out as a, a SharePoint MVP working for a migration vendor. Uh, and so, yeah, it, you know, to see how that's come along, where people come from these obscure, I mean, occasionally people would come to me and say, oh, we're on this system. I'm like, I have never heard of that thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, does yeah. it migrate over? It's like, I, I, how would I know that? I don't know, because, you know, but it's uh, yeah, that's the 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 endless uh, complexity is uh, job security for many of us. <laughs> yeah, and then there's still the pain points. You know, there's a system a couple of years ago that had no APIs, no external connections whatsoever, and I had to write a custom solution to actually go into the database that was on the back end and, and figure out where to find the information I needed and do that. So that, you know, there's still a lot of painful things, but thankfully most modern systems are. are or including those kinds of APIs that are needed to, to interact with one another. And, and then you just got those middle platforms that make it easy to actually connect to them and, and move it. Yeah, that was, it was, uh, I, I think that the idea of the, the old school thinking for those vendors was that, you know, lock customers in and, and yeah. we started to see that transition. I mean, it was like 20 years ago where customers kind of pushed back and said, no, we want an easy way on and off. If we need to, if we outgrow, if you don't fulfill your SLAs, whatever, we need to be able to move, get back out of that system. Yeah, exactly. That's a selling point. Well, very cool. So, so Blake Barrett, what else are you doing out in the uh, community? What are, what's what's kind of your activities? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time um, doing speaking, you know, uh, podcasts, videos. Uh, uh, do some of my own videos. I, I like to speak at conferences. I spoke at. I think four or five different conferences last year. Um, it's one of the things that, you know, I kind of looked at my career four or five years ago and I realized, you know, I've, I've taken a lot from, from technology, but I haven't really been given much back. Mm. Uh, and so I decided that there was time for a change. So I, I started getting involved in, in user groups, started going to conferences, started speaking at conferences. Um, I, I'm also a part-time teacher with a, a, one of the boot camps. Um, and so, you know, I spend evenings and Saturdays doing some teaching stuff as well as, as, as uh, you know, providing time for those who are, are trying to transition their careers from, you know, whatever it is that they're coming from into technology. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to set aside some time each week to speak to people online and, and just uh, do one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions with people who are looking for that kind of thing. And I do keep an open calendar so that people can sign up for times to do that. Um and it's been amazing. You know, I've talked to so many different people who are coming from from so many different backgrounds of the past couple of years, you know, teachers, uh, nurses, um, manufacturing, whatever it might be, where they've gotten fed up with with the career, the path that they've had and, and wanted to get into technology. And I try to, to be a mentor and encourage in whatever way I can to help them along that path. Yeah, well, that sounds like a clear path for MVP. I mean, as a brand new MVP, because you just Got it this month, right? Yeah, yeah, it was actually just a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations on that. Yeah, yeah sometimes thing, it wasn't, you know, like I said, my whole background was Microsoft, but Microsoft stack, but it's never been a priority for me to, to pursue MVP or certifications until the last couple of years. So I thought, you know, it's, it's the way to go. I was talking to somebody last week interviewing who's been a five or seven time MVP and kind of made a similar comment. He, actually said that you know, uh, paraphrasing but like somebody who wants to become an mvp likely won't become an mvp <laughs> it's it's like it's the the sleeper cell people that they find there's there's something to be said about um having a little bit of humility but finding people that are doing it for the right reasons not because they're seeking after that the accolade uh yeah exactly and, and so i always say that uh you're like even if this ended, this run I'm on as an MVP, uh, if it ended, I'm still doing the same stuff. I will continue doing the things that I do. I'm not doing this for the MVP. I'm doing this because this is what I'm passionate about. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that. That's, that's the right way to go. 
Well, it's very cool. And I also see, so you have some, uh, so you've got some stuff in the back. Um, oh yeah. So, so here's the difference between us. So my wife is a designer. She took down all my stuff. So I, I had uh, quite a bit more. I always uh, joke that, uh, so I've got Grogu, of course, behind me, but that was my wife left it up as a joke. And I'm just like, no, 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 you put it there. So my designer placed it there. I'm not touching it. So it's, it's been there. So she every time she comes down here, I'm in the basement and she'll complain about, uh, about that. But once in a while, I'll slip something else in and she'll call it out. She's like, nope, you added that item <laughs> back down off there, so. Yeah, I mean, especially like the Legos and stuff. That's uh, stuff that I've really kind of gotten into the last couple of years. I, I used to have a bunch when I was growing up, and my parents gave them away when I went off to college. And same for a while, it was just for my kids for a while. But you know, the last couple of years, I'm like, yeah, I want to start getting some of those for myself and start building them again. And, you know, there, and then I need, was, of course, need a place to put them. So. There, if you if you've not seen, there's the new uh, well, new. It's a few years old now, but SNL did a skit of the adults that were into the new Star Wars stuff and kind of uh, encroaching on the kids if you go look up you know snl star wars collectors uh it's hilarious a little thing i'll check that out yeah. ad. um but you know did the same thing like my wife is just up we're getting ready to move uh early summer and so she's like started now because that's the way she thinks um as she's organizing but i've got a couple boxes where when the prequel movies came out so when was that in the 90s like 99 yeah. 98 somewhere in there when that happened i had little kids i went and bought a bunch of the stuff that i had when i was young and uh and, and but what we did is we took off all of the guns all of the removable parts like gun turrets on spaceships and all the things that would fall off or break off or get lost we took them all off of them so we gave them these bare bones like the millennium falcon that didn't have the top flap didn't have the guns on it the kids are always complain about that I'm like you'll thank me for it. We have them all in these boxes. So we put them all yeah. back on. So uh, and just, just in time for my kids who are three of four of whom are now married and two of them have kids now. And they're like, yeah, dad, I'm, I don't need these Star Wars things. <laughs> so, <laughs> so really I let them play with it for a few years so I could then have them again, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's all good it, for the, for the, grandchildren they'll be there <laughs> yeah yeah that was, that was one of the things i kind of uh was was sad to see him go especially was especially one set in particular there was a, a set that i had of uh, lego when i first got into lego one of my very first big sets was called the galaxy explorer it was like their first big spaceship kind of lego set and they actually re-released a new version of that this past summer and i've got it. it's actually behind my head you can't see it right now mm -hmm. um but it, it's a uh, it's kind of incredible to see them kind of going back and revisiting some of the old stuff. Well, it was, uh, yeah, I'm just happy that the, I, I think it was the uh, McFarlane toys that really kind of took it to the next level with the level oh, of yeah. detail and realism. And that changed. I mean, I, I know we're getting way off topic on that, but that changed uh, and you don't have to be into spawn. And I had a ton of the spawn, you know, the McFarlane toys, the spawn stuff, the level of detail around those, um, I actually collected them. I was working for the phone company, just side story here, really short, but uh, I was working at the phone company and I got my first week and I noticed people had like the shelf with all of the stuff there at, at, at the phone company. And I was like, well, I don't have anything. So I went and purchased a bunch of the spawn characters for the shelf and people would walk by and like, what is this death shelf or whatever <laughs> this, you know? Yeah. You're not familiar with spawn you go look up your know, uh, no. yeah. toys and spawn and you'll see what i mean um so i i didn't do it because i was into it but just so i had something and then just kind of make fun of it of the the, the process but now i've just you know like everybody i've collected things my mine is a uh, lord of the rings stuff so uh that's what was up there all taken down maybe someday I'll have it back. Yeah, my, my other big collection, aside from the the Legos, is the is model trains. I got a, a huge collection down down the basement. So, but uh, yeah, that's that's very cool. That can be an expensive hobby. It is a very expensive hobby. Yeah, but thankfully, most of what I have I inherited from my father when he passed. But uh, he collected most of his life. But I've also added quite a bit to the collection myself. So that's very cool. Well, Barrett, really appreciate your time today. For folks that yeah, want. No to connect with you reach out to you what are the best ways to reach you 
Yeah, uh, the two places I'm most active are on LinkedIn and Twitter. I mean, Twitter is at Barrett Blake, just my name, uh, two R's, one T. Uh, I also, BarrettBlake.dev is my blog site. Um, you can get to all my links from there as well. Awesome. And of course, I'll have the links out on the blog post at AdamBuckleyPlanet.com and out on YouTube as well. So you watch or listening to it'll also the links will be out on uh, on the podcast. So, well, Barrett, really appreciate your time today. And uh, hopefully we'll have a uh, MVP summit this year. I don't know about in person. Yeah. I think it's going to be virtual again, but eventually. Well, hopefully we, we can start getting back into that. You know, one of the other things that I'm in, involved in is I'm uh, uh, on the board for a JavaScript conference here in Columbus that we've been trying to, to get off the ground. And first year was great. And second year was pretty good. And then, of course, COVID and we had to actually I had to cancel it last year but this year we're on and we're going to be doing it numbers seem to be on the August. rise for in-person events yeah. so yeah we're we're planning ours here locally as well hope so yeah i hope it, it seems to be bouncing back and i hope it keeps going yep all right well thanks a lot barrett all right thank you very much appreciate it